So you're in the extreme deployment talk. Uh, I'd imagine it did not show up in your program because of my personal delinquency in handing it to the, to the planner. Um, so uh, real quick, uh, this is Brian Clapper. He is the CTO of Circonus. Um, and over the last couple of years has tried to glue all of the parts that we have together and now has the <laughs> title of whipping boy of the modern SaaS stack. And for those of you don't, that don't know or whatever, this is Theo. He is the repeat denier of reality. So whenever I come in and say something's broken, he's like, stack tracer, get the fuck out. And I give him a stack trace. And he's like, well, that couldn't really happen. That, that didn't happen that way. It's like, fucking stack trace. Now fix it. Denying reality has its powers. It's a good thing. So real quick, just how things used to be and how things are in a lot of places still, and you're all kind of familiar with this, is the, the, the web was driven on user data. So a user loads a web page, they get a response, that's, that's a piece of data. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, the age old, it's been that way since the very beginning, you know, there's not a whole lot going on bet between page loads or whatever, you have a, maybe a cookie or something like that, but that's about it. So what that means is you have two kind of, of Systems. You have isolated systems where I load a web page, Theo loads a web page. Our interactions aren't really, you know, there, there's no interaction between us. So, like typical e commerce sites, um, you know, I, I'm looking at product A, he's looking at product B. There's, there's no kind of correlation between the two. Or newer styles like, like Amazon or something like that, where you have this, this latent impact on what I'm viewing because I might be viewing the Badonkadonk tank. And I'm also then go and, and look at Theo's book. So then he might open his book to see if anybody's been looking at it and say users that saw this also are interested in the Badonkadonk tank. Yeah, I, I think that there's a lot of um, this, this idea of latency, which I think is really suitable to follow directly after uh, to Cantrell and Greg's talk on dirty apps. Um, this idea that uh, users a, user a does something and it has some sort of effect on user B. And almost everybody would say, well, my app does that, right? I take all the user behaviors, I take what they do, I take um, information about my, my business and my architecture and my market, and I crunch it in Hadoop, and I load a model into my system for the next day. Like uh, 86,400 seconds to me is latency. Um, that shows up a lot later. Um, the interesting part to me is that if I do something on a page, and a second later, Clapper loads, the, loads another page where he could be influenced by, by my action, and he's not, that's one second. That's a lot of instructions that could have happened. That is also latency. Um, so if you can imagine, I don't know how many people here make international phone calls, um, but talking to someone and having them pause for two seconds while they're waiting for your voice to like, you know, float over the, over the ocean, um, that's, that's a really annoying amount of latency, and, and, and people are starting to become used to uh, an alternative to that. So, you know, reproducing problems in the, the typical world is, they, they can be hard if you have a lot of traffic, you know, replaying HTTP traffic or something like that is, is a problem for some sites, especially really large sites. I think Archer bitched about it on Twitter like a year ago. You know, his amount of traffic, it's really hard to reproduce that. Um, but, I mean, some of it is, you know, if it's just like, I load this page, then this page, then this page, that's really easy to, to redo. I can go to dev, I can load that page, then this page, then this page, and like, oh, hey, look at that, there's the error. So, now switching into more extreme. Um, uh, I mean, the whole generalist, software generalist, we're, we're in this to, 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 to win this, right? And we've got really large architectures. We've got you know, routers and switches and load balancers all the way down into, into the disk. And when something breaks, you fix it, right? If it's a web page where there's a render bug in IE 7 or something like that, you have to go fix it. If you had MySQL sex vault on you, you have to go debug the core. Um, if you have disk latencies, you have to go understand your controllers and see what they're doing. Um, th there aren't any limits to this. Uh, but in older architectures, there is this flow of data that it's easier to repeat in development, right? So someone reports a bug and your first thought is, okay, I need to reproduce this, right? So I'm not gonna, re I, maybe I'll even reproduce the bug in production just so that I believe them because most people are full of shit. Um, so they're like, hey, this is broken. And you're like, no, it's not, it's not for me. Look, it's not for me. And then you end up going over to their desk or they send you screenshots or you do a screen sharing session. You're like, how the fuck did that happen? You know, like what is going on? But in most systems, the idea of taking that and in some way, shape or form over the next hour or day, being able to take that back into a development environment and repeat and witness that problem 
to prove to yourself that you solved it is possible. Um, in the new world, I don't think that that's so possible anymore. Uh, Google Spanner is a great example of that. Like how many atomic clocks do you need in your dev lab to start reproducing the errors at that point, right? They have atomic clocks spread around the, the world to, to synchronize um, uh, ev events coming into the system. It becomes very, very challenging. Um, and the reason is, is because we're no longer being driven by data coming into the system from people so much as we are being also driven by data coming in from systems. And systems can throw up a lot faster than people can. Um, they can throw you know, millions and millions of data points at you a second, and assimilating those is, is challenging. So there's a new form where every single piece of information coming in into an architecture has some sort of impact, impact. It affects users that are using that architecture. Um, and we'll, we'll get into exactly how um, we are acutely affected by that at Cronus, um, but I, I see the future of this um, affecting everyone. So we have responsive design, for example, and I think responsive design is this awesome, awesome idea that is entirely, I'm gonna just steal the term, because the way the design industry uh, defines responsive design to me is the tip of the iceberg of what we can be doing with responsive design. But and we have it, to solve some problems. And it's not even a, a single user's subsequent experience. Like a lot of, you have a, a Google Analytics account or a Circonus account or something like that where it's a shared account across users. If I do something, Theo expects it to show up whenever he loads the page again and that can be a second later or you know a millisecond later. So th this argument that eventual consistency is a great model for things, um, uh, things are only as good a model as you can map into your brain. Um, so uh, we'll get to some more concrete examples of that. Um, but sometimes the data must be part of the subsequent experience of the user. It actually changes the way the application works. It changes the way a function works. A great example of that, which is an easy one to solve, is like I click that I want to add a Pokemon into my cart on Amazon. When I go to view my cart, um, it should be in the cart. Like I just put it in the cart. It's, incredibly confusing to add something to your cart and go look at your cart and not see it in your cart. It's like, it's like can you imagine walking down Target, you know, you're in Target and you pick up some like dishwashing detergent, you drop it in your cart and it fucking disappears. And it's like, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all. And we're having more and more applications where um, the users are, are, are having trouble bridging that gap. And we get complaints all the time at, at Circonus where someone's looking at their system and their CPU spikes, and then they go over and look at the graphs, and they're like, but it doesn't say the same thing. It's like, it's gotta get there. It's gotta, you know, it's gotta get there, or it got there and disappeared, and, and you're, looking, you're looking at two different perspectives on the same thing. It's like taking two shutter, shutter shots of the same system. Um, so it, it's very difficult, but that doesn't matter. Like, it doesn't matter that it's hard, uh, because users' brains want to, to, to be satisfied that way. So we have to figure out something. I was just surprised you're adding Pokemon to your cart and not My Little Pony. You know, there's room for everything. <laughs> I have three daughters, they keep me on my toes. Um, so social systems, obviously, I think this is the easiest one for everyone to, 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 to grok, right? I mean, you're on Twitter and you follow someone, it would be pretty silly for you to not start seeing the messages that they, they send, right? That, that seems really obvious, but at that point, user B, who you followed, everything that they do has an effect on your experience on that site. So it breaks down that isolation. So social systems um, and shared systems have already destroyed isolation. Um, and because of the responsive web and, and because of the focus on performance and you know, Google's mission to make the web faster and all of this, all, all these reports about uh, you know, revenues going up and conversion rates going up when you, when you increase um, performance, decrease page load time, um, people are making it faster. And if it's not you, uh, you won't be in a job tomorrow, right? You have to do it too, you have to keep up. Um, we have set the bar pretty high. I mean, it's, it's got a ways to go, but the bar's pretty high already. And even traditional, like, breaking out and scaling techniques. Like, if you were at the Lightning Talks last night, Mark has a, Mark Fowler had a good example of this, where I, I load up a photo and I tag myself and Theo into it, so whenever he loads up his photo stream, he expects to see that photo too, and I load up mine and I expect to see it. So we can't just scale out and isolate ourselves to individual zones. Anything that's shared has to be on kind of like the main system. So, and the idea that I can, what's that? Uh, okay, all right. The idea that I can um, split those things out into different systems, but lazily replicate them back and forth, and they'll be eventually consistent, will just eventually piss me off now, right? It's, it's <laughs> like, they're not tagged, they are tagged, what, what, what have you. So 
I think the reason for all of these problems is because the systems are now highly distributed. It's not just that you have a service-oriented architecture with everyone talking to each other. It's that there's a lot of asynchronous things going on. Um, there's a lot of parallel computation going on. Uh, I don't know how many people here use service-oriented architectures where internal components are available over REST. Um, but chances are, if you go in and you need to do 10 REST calls, um, you're probably doing it wrong if you do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Right? You should have a dependency graph and you say, hey, I can do all five of these right now. So you fire off five, you wait and collect them back. All of those things are happening at the same time. So tracing those is really hard. Um, and debugging and understanding distributed systems requires a, a, a view of precipitating state, which sucks, right? Because uh, even in highly multi-threaded environments, which are are a challenge, right? If you've ever done procedural programming and you have a bug, if you don't see the bug right away, chances are it's a compiler optimization or some part of the language you don't understand where things were reordered because like it's, it's doing what it said. When you go into a multi-thread environment, now you have all these ideas of, of race, uh, race conditions and, and, and things like that, right? Where you have a different perspective on the state. The crazy part about that is like when shit blows up and you give me a core file, that was the state. I get to look at it, right? In a distributed system when shit blows up, a lot of times it keeps going, because that's the way it's designed, and you have no idea what the state looked like on that box. But that's not even the hard part, right? So even if you knew what the state was like on that box, you don't know what the state was like on all the other boxes. So it is absolutely, I, I, I won't say that it's impossible, I'll just say that it's impossible for any person today. Um, to be able to reconstruct the precipitating state of a failure in distributed systems. It's a mind-bending exercise, which leads to treacherous debuggability problems in distributed systems. When, when shit breaks, like, it's, I mean, it's, a, it's an episode of crying, right? I, I have five bottles of scotch on my desk at work. Literally, five bottles most, of scotch. Most, mostly empty. They're all in various states. Like, when you sit all day looking at a bug, where you're trying to figure out, you know, there is a state transition on this box and I didn't get the data over here. That happened five hours ago and the system's still running. There was some precipitating state that, that led to a logic problem, a bug. Um, and one of the problems we had was, was uh, Sun Studio 12.1 compiler error doing, doing math wrong, right? So I had floating point error calculation that got propagated through a distributed system. You're trying to find the bug, right? I mean, that's why they, Invite, invent nooses, right? You just kind of move on, stay calm. It's hard to stay calm. That's why we have liquor. Um, so I studied this for a long time and I, I didn't want to do it anymore. So I went into an industry where I stare at it all day. And so gave us all the suck now. Thanks. Yes, yes, yes. So um, expedient debugging requires a realization of precipitating state. This is <laughs> absolutely critical. Um, and this is why when we debug systems, we try to repeat them, right? You have a test scenario, like uh, having worked on a shipped product, which was not a distributed system, or it had about 99% of it was not distributed. Every time there was a bug, there was actually a mandate in the process, the software engineering process, which I was supportive of, um, that in order to fix a bug, you must have a test to prove that there is a bug. You must give me a test case that proves the bug. If you can't, try harder. You have a test, the test fails, you commit the fix, the test pass, and the other 10,000 tests that you've written also still pass so you don't have regressions. This is like basic testing, right? The problem in distributed systems is that it is incredibly difficult to create the precipitating state for one of those failures without changing the system in a way that doesn't act like production anymore. So, postmortem sucks. Um, Post-mortem techniques, all these techniques for, for, for debugging systems that have grown out of the, the decades of, of Unix development and, 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 and compiler, you know, compiler writing and compilation and, and all of this. Like the idea that I can give somebody um, a, a core file off my box and give somebody a kernel panic core file. They look at it and they're like, ah, oh, shit, I see the bug. And it's like, wow, I always thought that was magical. And the reason that I thought that was magical is I was always working in distributed systems, where somebody gives me a core file, I'm like, what the fuck am I gonna do with that? Like, I, that's one out of 25 systems that we're running off of, and they all 
Okay. The only thing that I care about of why that crash is what the state was of the other 24, which you can't give me a snapshot of. So um, the older techniques, I think, still completely apply, because when MySQL seg faults, you still have to fix it. Um, but as our systems increase in complexity, um, it, it kind of goes away. So why do we see this problem? I think I'll let you talk about Circonus a bit. So yeah, Circonus is, uh, for lack of a better term, I think Jason actually coined this whenever we first started out as a data whore. Now you remember, yeah, see, you're smiling. So we, we just want everything. We want all of, all of the data. And most of this data is not user generated. It is systems generating the data. It's, it's running checks every minute or every 30 seconds. Or if you're looking at it in real time, it's every one second or every couple milliseconds. So we have all of this data that's coming in. It's, it's you know, IO or it's CPU or it's my revenue or, you know, it can be anything. It's, it's numbers, lots and lots of freaking numbers. So we use this, you know, as any good monitoring system does. We do correlation, we do visualization, we do alerting, and we do analytics on it. Um, you know, monitoring is just not one piece. A lot of people say, you know, I, I have my graphs, I'm monitoring. Well, you know, you're, you're doing visualization of it, or you're doing correlation of it, you're not really doing alerting on it. So we do all of those things in, in this big kind of complex system that we'll get to in the next slide or not. Now, well, it, it, like I said, it, it's, this is all really high velocity. Um, we, have, we have all of these brokers out in the world that are collecting all this data. We have you know, hundreds of brokers collecting thousands and thousands of data points streaming in at thousands or tens of thousands a second, and it makes it, yeah, lots of stuff. So I, I'm I mean, starting to get into the therapy here. I'm just gonna start yeah. twitching on the stage. So everybody, I mean, I don't know how many people have, have systems where you have statistics and telemetry data coming in. I know that, 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 that Etsy's here and their, their, their StatsD stuff was specifically designed for that, that problem is collecting that sort of statistics. Um, if you can imagine having everyone in the room get together and try to funnel it into one service with one set of maintenance windows and one set of architecture, that sucks, by the way. Perhaps retrospectively a poor decision um, to start a company that does that. Um, so <laughs> mainly because this data is so much more th important than your shopping cart. <laughs> when I drop, if I dropped dish detergent in a bag and then it was gone, I think I would be fascinated, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, holy shit, I have a bag of holding. What, what's going on, you know? Uh, um, but <laughs> if I have a production crash <laughs> and Circona says, dude, that's fine, like, I'm pissed. I'm not confused, I'm not excited, I'm angry, right? This data that's coming in is absolutely critical to making other people successful in debugging their systems. So the availability of it is really important, and it, the it, timeliness is really important. And it doesn't help that whenever people come to our site and they set up stuff and that we're start ingesting all this data, but the next time they come to the site is usually when something broke at 3 a.m., so they're already pissed. Not at us, they're pissed at their own stuff. And then they get pissed at us because, well, it doesn't, you know, something's not showing up right, or I don't understand what this graph is showing me. Absolutely. So then it's, it's kind of get back into like where Brian and Brendan were like, whose fault is it? Not us, not us, not us. And I, I've made the statement before, with the whole bastard operator from hell, I did a lot of operations work, and it's like operations people are really, they can only ever disappoint you, right? Their job is to run something all the time, and you can't ever do any better than all the time. So basically, any mistake basically defeats you. And I've had people come up to me and say, you, you just don't set expectations correctly. I'm like, well, of course I don't, right? I don't set them at all. Um, people really need these things up when they need them up, and I can't control when that is. You know, your bank is another thing. You don't actually need to do bank reconciliation at 2 a.m. on a Sunday, because you could have done it at 2 a.m. on a Saturday. Um, so uh, businesses which can afford a weekly maintenance window, I, I don't understand stand how to operate in those. The problems are so different and so foreign to me. Um, I, I don't recommend anybody start a company that requires 100% 100% uptime unless you're batshit insane, by the way. So so I was really surprised at how, I'll say whiny, uh, didn't put it in the slides because I don't want to repeat it, whiny, impatient and demanding users are. They're like your site's slow or you know, like oh this, this doesn't look right. And then I started using Circonus to debug Circonus and I was like, this fucking doesn't work. Like, I need the data now. I, you know, you can't tell me that the threshold was exceeded when it wasn't or, or it's late. You can't tell me 30 seconds late. You need to tell me after 100 milliseconds. So I, I got really 
antsy and angry and, and well, this is a kind of one of the deepest empathetic sessions of my life. So what does the architecture look like? So yeah, th this was this term was has been used for for other things. This is what people want, and it's it really to me it's what it is. I mean, I grew up with Voltron. I, I had the castle. I had all of the lions. They, they were all the die cast ones too, which were really nice. And you could throw at people and hurt them. So like a black lion attack, smack. Anyway, so that's kind of what we did, what we what we built here. We don't have this big monolithic system. We have all of these moving parts. So we have all of these brokers around the world, in users, networks, all of that collecting all the data. They're feeding things back to. I think every time I move this way, it stops picking up. So they're feeding back into the aggregators, which are then passing everything onto the message queue, pushing into the storage system. Um, and then with that, all of the, the, the fault detection stuff is reading that off, doing events streaming and, and the real-time fault detection on it. So you have these, the, the storage system where people are gonna come back and view their graphs, but then you have the alerting where if you, you know, if you tell me a couple seconds after something is broken, that's, to me, that's bad. Like we strive to be under a second with, with most of that stuff, including getting the SMS to my phone which we have no control over, but we at least deliver it to the provider at that point. Um, you know, minutes later or, or anything beyond that is just inconceivable, I right. guess is the, is the right word. Yes, inconceivable, yes. Disk I.O. latency of five seconds is inconceivable. Yes. Yes, uh, and, and to, I mean, that's, I think, there were supposed to be five because Voltron had five parts. There are 18 different system components that interact inside of our architecture, um, and there are some huge advantages to that and there are huge disadvantages to that. We've gone over all of the disadvantages which can be summed up is that it's a distributed nightmare. Yeah, I, I stay awake at night in cold sweats on the bathroom floor shaking. So despair, what does it really look like? Um, we'll cry in front of you. Um, uh, we're, we're, I'll show some, some porn graphs later um, <laughs> with, with Clapper's despair. I even have, you know, Clapper considers suicide as one of the notes in there. Oh, good. It's great. He's modified some stuff that I haven't seen, so this yeah, will be fun. Great. So the question is, 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 is great. We're stuck with this architecture. The idea of having a monolithic architecture to serve this, I, I would actually just say is stupid. It's not a good idea. Um, it's so having a distributed architecture provides you, having a distributed architecture provides you um, the facility to do some pretty magical things um, that solve all of the problems that we've discussed so far in that debugging is hard. So this sort of decoupling of the architecture allows for what I want, and I'll hope I'll convince you you want, which is the ability to recklessly develop. Um, I don't know how many people here develop crappy code. <laughs> yeah. I do it as a matter of spiritual enlightenment, I guess. <laughs> The reason I like to write crappy code is because it never leaves my laptop, right? I just write it, I compile it, it doesn't compile, I put the brace in the right space. I mean, I saw Cantrell write an aux statement with a missing clothes brace yesterday. <laughs> I mean, where's the quality standard, sir? So, yeah, I mean, we, th this idea that, that we can do this and we don't have to have things peer reviewed before we run them is, is just a foregone conclusion when we do private development, right? It's why we do personal development, we, we have it on our workstations, we have a little VM that's ours, whatever it is. Or you get it all working right and then you find out that D-Trace doesn't work in production. That's my cold sweats on the floor, so, <laughs> yeah. So we have this problem in that we are used to developing. It gives us our agility, um, it gives us our velocity of development that we can be reckless um, because we're private. Um, and the problem is, is that uh, we have in the past, not been able to use production data. It's, a, it's, a, it's incredibly expensive to use production data to do that. And now that we're building distributed systems that can't really be debugged well in development, we need to create an environment where we can develop in production with no consequences recklessly. And that is what I think we've achieved, not in every single facet at Zirconis, but um, I have been so pleasantly low stress and low blood pressure about some of the changes that would have, you know, skid marks, as, as Mr. Cantrell said. Um, so this leads to development and production. Um, so we'll do some very specific examples, describe them, and I have some graphs too now, so. Oh, good, okay. So the first thing we did, the first kind of a breakout we did in production was this, this dual storage system. Um, if you were here last year, you heard Theo talk about Snowth, which is our new distributed storage system for all of the time series data. We originally were using that in Postgres, and that's Reconnoiter um, in, in the open source project uses Postgres to store all of its data, and that's what we were using, but 
with all of the data that we were getting in that was quickly chewing up all of the disk space in Postgres. It was having some really nasty performance issues sometimes. So we need to get away from that, uh, if not for the performance reasons, but just for the amount of disks that we were gonna have to buy as we grew. We had this graph that was, it was bad. Um, oh, hey, there it is. So it kept going up, and you see it drop off. That's us removing all of the, the kind of backup data that we had on the systems. So every now and again, I would get a message from Robert Tweed, like, hey, your disks are full. It's like, you're the DBA, fix it. So he would fix it by removing stuff that we, we just didn't use and we didn't need. Yeah, a little bit. Well, if you get woken up at 3 a.m., you start every day and get twitchy and stuff. So, so we, had the, we, we made this dull, dull architecture. And obviously, you write a storage system, and you're not going to just throw everyone's data on it and be like, have fun. Um, the biggest nightmare would have been, you know, pushing everyone onto it, and then one day wake up and realize that, you know, everything crashed. That'd be bad, but everything crashed, and you lost all the data, and it's no longer recoverable, which would have been way, way, way worse. And, and six months into the deployment, we realized that um, due to a compiler bug in Sun Studio 12.1 that we had miscalculated the running standard deviation, we used to store standard deviation of the data, and it was, it was all wrong. It was completely, completely fucking broken. But no one other than the beta users ever saw that because what we had done is in the aggregator that was collecting all of this data and pushing it into Postgres normally, it was now pushing it into Postgres and then pushing it into Snowth. So we added these user flags um, to the site that we, we let a couple people know where they were and they could sit, we, we asked them to, you know, please look at your data the, the way you're used to seeing it and then turn on the snow flag and, and look at it again, see if you notice any issues. And, and that's all we did. We, we ran, I think one of us would run all Postgres, one of us would run all snow. And as we noticed issues on the site, we would compare the two and like, hey, the data, the data looks right. And we ran that way for, for six months, 12 months, something like that. Um, yeah, there you go. And so we were happy with the, with the results. We weren't seeing any differences other after we fixed the compiler problem and redid all of the derivatives and, and all of that. That was interesting, but we were able to push all that data back into Snowth because we had it in Postgres. If you look at that, that's, that's like 17 months of having data in that both systems. That long? Was, yeah, Damn. so we Damn actually long. ran, yeah, yeah, it was that long. Wow. So it, it, was, it was actually really, so, so can you imagine like, rolling out your new storage architecture and what you do is you wake up one morning and you're like oh sh shit that's not the default because it had been running for 17 months right and we had been using it half of our users had elected to use it and we'd flip back and forth and every time they would say hey my graph looks wrong it would be to like flip flop and we would look back and forth between the two storage systems which is how we found the standard deviation problem and had to reload like six months worth of data into the system to fix the problem um, and the, the nice, the one thing he's not, we're not describing here is what we're seeing here is the massive amount of storage savings we realized by flipping to the new system. Those are on different axes too. The right axis you can't see. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Nice screenshot. Thanks. Uh, no, 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 I, I turned it off. Oh, well, that's right. Um, so the, the, the interesting part there is so like when the data comes into the system, it's all unconditionally split across these two things. It's a concept of, of mirror, mirrored the stream. So we have this stream of input data and we mirrored it. Um, on the access side, we have these feature flags and the feature flags are set up in the user's profile or their cookie and we can see them in JavaScript and we can see them in our Perl application and we can see them all throughout the stack. So anywhere in the code where you're, you can just say, you know, is this feature turned on? What's the value of this? Or the, you know, what personality does this application have? And then the user, will, you know, the application infrastructure that pulls that will just start siphoning out of a different backend store. And Baltimore spirit, don't just put a mustache on the side, put a natty bow on a slide. So that's natty, National Bohemian beer. If you want to have an experience that may not be satisfying, you should try that before you leave. <laughs> now, I, I, I think you added graphs that are gonna be coming up here that might yes. make me cry yes. later. This, is, this was the, the absolute bane of my existence for a while, so. <sighs> The original streaming processor we used was Esper. I, there was a period of time where I, I liked Esper. Esper was fun. It let us do all of these, these nice things. Like if you haven't used Esper, it has all of your data streaming in. They, they go into these windows, and then you can, you can create new windows off the data. You can query the windows into other tables. It, it gets a really SQL-like syntax. So you can do all of this cool stuff. Um, you can, you, it, it makes it really flexible for, for doing different things with it. 
Like we used it at first mainly because we didn't really know what exactly we wanted to do. We knew that we had the, these sets of features that we wanted to be able to alert on, um, but we didn't know what we'd add in the future. So we had Esper, you know, running and, and all of these queries running and whatnot. And then it fucked us. So, Esper, I, I was talking to somebody last night and they were like, oh yeah, we're gonna build this event correlation system and we're gonna do it in Esper. And I was like, please fucking don't. So, like, so it, it, just to, to say, we still use Esper in our architecture, it just has a restraining order and can't come within 50 feet of Clapper. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. So we had this problem where, uh, so Esper, this is a log-based graph, just so you can see the differences. Uh, because you can't see the, 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 the fixes on the right because they look like zero. Um, but we were tracking the n amount of time spent on CPU. So in this case, it's tracked in, in, in microseconds. So if you spend a million microseconds on the CPU per second, you're busy, right? It's all of them. So you, you spent all of your, all of your dollars. Um, so we were tracking the basically CPU saturation of the, of the event processor. And as the, um, the, the rule sets grew, um, the, the, it, it had this horrible pathological failure where it would um, uh, tickle, 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 touch the doll in the wrong spot of the GC system in, 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 uh, for the JVM. And uh, it would uh, start- I, I don't even want to blame Java on this. I just want to blame Esper. Okay, you can blame Esper. But it was, so, it was something like 4,000 rolls a second. Fine, you know, everything's happy, hunky-dory, great. 4,010, oh no, fuck you, 100%. Yep. Like, it would flip. what? So yeah. So so I think I have. Um, let's see. This is where it's saturated. That's not a good graph. Um, we distributed it. So we we already have the ability to partition this. So we can send certain accounts information over a different a CEP engine. Um, the, the problem was is that we had one shared customer. I, I guess Joyent has spent some time uh, fixing Voxer bugs. We had spent some time fixing Voxer bugs. Um, or our bugs induced by Voxer, as I would be more appropriate. Um, so we had partitioned it out where we put, you know, we hash all of the accounts, and we do this by um, uh, hex buckets. So I, we have 16 top levels, and then 16 levels below that, and 16 levels below that. So our routing rules looked pretty disgusting because we had singled out one customer on one entire node, and then the rest of them were all hashed out, and it still was at 100% CPU. Which, I mean, 100% CPU was, was fine. It was still doing what it was doing. I would look at it and see 100%, it's like, oh shit, and then I would go test things out, and it's like, oh no, I'm still alerting, like, it, everything's cool. So we're like, okay, it's spin locking on something, it decided to switch to that for so long. But then we get these reports that, hey, that alert that I was supposed to get came to me three hours later. It's like, but what? Like, okay, did, did your SMS not get to you in time? It's like, no, no, this was email. It's like, can you send me the email headers? Like, no, it was definitely three hours after the fact. And you look and it's like everything coming into Esper is fine and Esper's at 100% and everything going out of Esper looks normal. What the fuck is it doing? Yeah, so, so the idea of having like a five second disk IO latency where most of them are 10 milliseconds, uh, almost all of our event processing stuff that happens, we have a sub one millisecond turnaround time for almost everything that happens yeah. in the system. Yeah. Um, and to have outliers that are three hours versus sub one millisecond uh, was, a, was a horrible, horrible problem. It was a really difficult thing to track down. Um, we tracked it down by setting it on fire and throwing it away um, and re-implementing it from scratch. So this, and it's, Clapper and it's, considers suicide as the annotation on the graph here. Um, uh, this is where the blue line spikes to 100% CPU, just flat lines. Uh, when things flatline, they flat, it's very bad, right? Flatline zero, flatline anywhere. If it's completely constant, not good, unless it's like the switch speed on your, on your, on your port. Um, so during that, in preparation for Harry Carey, uh, we kind of took a recess and we re-implemented exactly the rules that we had in Esper and Pure Java, did a lot of performance testing. And the beauty of this system was that we were testing in production. We already had the ability to split these streams out so we could bring up a new complex event processor, run it right alongside the other one. We could even take all of the output, all the events that it saw, all the, hey, I think this is broken, and send it back to our case management system. And the case management system would create a case that the user couldn't see because everything was split out, right? So we were able to just willy-nilly launch things up in production and see the real event stream because we weren't able to repeat any of these performance problems in development at all, even with all of the same data. It had, I think it had to do with arrival rates that were really hard to reproduce. 
Um, and at the end of the day, you either build a huge set of tools to reproduce the specific your problem you're seeing now to solve it, to not see that problem again, or you kind of just, you know, you, you streak, right? You just go out and run around and see what happens, right? And if you can do it in production, you can actually see what, see what happens there. Um, and then we were able to fix the problem here. And this is Esper is now dead event where we dropped. And if, I mean, to, to see the graph there, that's flatlined at a million and now we're at uh, uh, 1,200 there about. So we went from 100% CPU utilization to 1.2% CPU utilization by re-implementing all of that. Um, the point wasn't so much the optimization. The point was we were able to do it entirely safely in production because we had built the systems to accept mirrored streams of data. And we built the systems that, that have outputs, so all these things that have inputs. The input part's kind of easy, right? The, the data comes in, I can just copy it and send it to two places. The output streams are really tricky because if you act on that data, um, that action can piss somebody off, for example. So if we were duplicating this event stream and it fired an alert and it actually paged somebody at 3 a.m. and they got a nice page at 3 a.m. and said, wake up, Clapper's code that he wrote three minutes ago decided your shit's broken, right? That would be, that would lose a customer, right? So the idea of being able to isolate the outputs of that um, is building systems that have idempotent outputs. And then deployment of this is stupid easy because you've already deployed it. It just flip a bit, restart, done. So I think the, the one that we're working Oof. on now, which I think is really interesting, is that we've actually leveraged our queuing system to do almost all of the work. So we have a queuing system where we submit the messages once and, and we have uh, you know, multiple subscribers to a topic so people can kind of listen in and act as if they would, if, if they were in charge. You just, you know, you just say, yes, yeah, very nice. Yes, I'll just continue to watch you. Um, and every once in a while we'll send double messages in. Maybe we'll send them to two different uh, exchanges or something like that. So now we have the problem where our message queue is no longer satisfying us at all. So we use RabbitMQ. Uh, it's a great product, but we're pushing it in ways that I don't think it was intended to go. It's a, it's a rather general purpose message queuing product and it's got a lot of baggage that I'm not interested in. If you're using most any message queue, what I found, I gave a talk on this, don't, their benchmarks are meaningless. Like, unless you're using your actual data flow through them. Because the biggest thing with RabbitMQ is they say, you know, 20,000 messages a second. We don't see anywhere close to that. Even, you know, with all of the best practices around doing it, we see nowhere close. We see, like, maybe 5,000 if we're lucky. Well, their test cases are really tiny messages, like saying, hello, or this is a product ID that somebody requested. It's like, okay, well, ours are 6K. Yeah. So, like, yeah, we have large JSON objects that are flowing over. And, and another interesting benchmark I saw, they were sending zero-byte messages. I'm not exactly what they were trying to, I don't know what, sure, I'm not sure what they were trying to communicate there. Um, perhaps only the arrival rate, right? That's the only piece of information I have at that point is the arrival rate. Um, so uh, the, the message size, we have certain messages that need some durability and persistence to them, but the vast majority of messages, this is a very dirty application, right? We're getting telemetry data all the time. So if I have a piece of data that comes in and I miss it, I'd rather get a fresh copy again than the old copy late. Um, it's really, really bad to have uh, latent data. So in this system, um, what we have to do is we still have to mirror the streams and we still have to make it idempotent, but we can't use the queue to do that because that's what we're trying to replace. So what we're doing is we're taking all of the applications that connect to that queue and we're building in the, the second technology, basically. So being able to multiplex out of that. So when, a, when a, a message comes in and I need to push it onto a queue, I may push it over AMQP to RabbitMQ, and in this case, we're pushing it over uh, FQ, uh, which is a project we're working on that's open source. It, it is FQ. If you, in GitHub, it says it has asterisks and pound signs and things. So it is about fucking queues. Um, some people thought it was fast. Uh, no, it was just an anger thing. <laughs> uh, I was talking to somebody else. It's like the, the video game, video games, if I, I rage quit, right? Like with, with RabbitMQ, like when it really doesn't work, Erlang has this beautiful ability to... Print out parentheses? Print out parentheses, and braces. Yes, yeah, uh, braces. It has a beautiful ability to um, spiral into a horrid, horrid plane crash of a death when it, when it goes down and behave really, really well when it's close to that, right? So there's no leading indicators in a lot of ways where it's just like everything is good and then it's like, I misfired, I misfired, I exploded. 
and it's like, oh. And then it boots back up, and you have to delete the amnesia database, and it's like, I don't remember what happened. So, yeah. so, so there are some challenges there. Um, and then the, the, the new system, um, basically what we're doing is we're taking every piece of, of, of architecture that talks to the MQ, and we're changing the way we interface with that. It's not like we integrate against RabbitMQ anymore, um, which we were using AMQP to do. We have an API we have internally, and we mapped the RabbitMQ MQP libraries to that, and we mapped the FQ libraries to that. So now we can just say, if I wanted to do four message buses, we can just add the four in, and it'll shoot it across all of them. Um, and that the whole point of that is so that FQ, I wrote FQ. I'm never, never going to run that in production until it's already been in production, right? It's the chicken and egg problem. And luckily, we're not writing file systems, so uh, this, is, this is a problem. Um, in message queuing, I can write this just like the, 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 the database system, and I can run it for months and months and months and realize why I don't understand how it behaves. Why is there latency? Oh, I don't have the right telemetry information. I can't monitor it the correct way. I can fix all of those problems, and there's zero risk as long as RabbitMQ keeps functioning. And we're at about 20% on RabbitMQ, so we've got 80% overhead. So as long as you guys don't convince 30,000 people in Cleveland to sign up, then we'll be all right. Um, the Browns lost last night. <laughs> so I don't think they're in a happy place right now. So that's good. All right. So where does this take us? I think the really interesting part is this becomes the new responsive web. This idea of data intensive applications where you have data flowing in, uh, it's, it's temporal rele relevance is, is really the only thing that makes it accurate. Right? If it's late, it's wrong. Um, it's this general soft real time system. But I think it's the first time that like web people uh, internet people have ever dealt with the, the, the mechanics of soft real-time systems. If you go talk to an avi a, a, um, aviation engineer, they understand real-time systems. If you go to a pacemaker designer, they understand to be hacked remotely over RF. So talk to the right community. Um, but, but from the web perspective, we, tr we, we, we try so hard to get the right answer, and we're really in a world where um, if you try really hard to get a right answer, there's a certain point where you, the answer is wrong, right? If I try for 10 milliseconds to get the right answer, that's great. If I try for 2,000 milliseconds to get the right answer, I can't give you the right answer anymore. It is necessarily wrong because of its latency. Um, and when we start to build new systems um, that are highly interactive using things like WebSockets, where we're gluing the community together and we expect immediate reactiveness to all the different environments, we're going to start to build systems for users um, where their expectation is that it maps to reality, right? And we have about 100 milliseconds that are, we don't have to go faster than that because our brains are too stupid. Um, but if you go much slower than that, you will disconnect the user from any sort of belief of reality. So I think that in these systems, our target response time for everything that we do and the responsiveness to the real world observations that we see. If you go put something in your shopping cart, if I need to see that, that has to transgress the entire system within 100 milliseconds, or we will eventually erode the user's experience to the point where they don't trust the product. Um, so, and building decoupled systems and developing in production is pretty much the only way we're gonna get there. That's it, does anybody have any questions? So the question is, how do we deal with two queues in action? Um, I would say that uh, it should resemble very closely how we dealt with two databases. And in, in, in we haven't used it enough in production to, to say, but I think it's exactly the same as the database, where when you're putting data into the database, um, e there is only a certain amount of time that you can spend to do that. So the key is to never allow them to quicksand you, right? So the worst case scenario is not that the queue malfunctions or disappears or I can't publish to it. The worst case scenario is I make an API call and it doesn't return for 25 seconds. Like that, that will screw you completely. Um, so the idea of, of, of capping all of your API calls, I really wish that there was a, like a, a language, someone's gonna go say, you can do that in Haskell. But um, I wish there was a language where you could define like a number of milliseconds um, for all of the API calls that you have internal to the application you're linking against so that you had a, a very controlled expected behavior 
um, a failure when latency is introduced anywhere below you. I don't care where it is in the stack. I made an API call to go publish on a message queue. Um, I need control back into my application within, in this case, 200 microseconds, maybe. If it goes beyond that, uh, you, should, you, should, you should abort. You should throw an error. You should log an error and throw the data on the floor. But I should be able to react to that. I should be able to specify that. And in the API calls that trans Express our applications, like when they, when they couple to other applications, we do that. The only places we can't do that, unfortunately, are writing to disk, because uh, it's really hard to abort a write to disk. You're, you have committed the ultimate sin by asking it to do anything. Um. Yes? Where can you learn more about Snowth? Um, There's videos online from last year? There is a video online from last year. If you search for I don't know. Um, it's it's uh, it's on YouTube. So we gave a present. It should be linked from the. Yeah, if, if you go to Omni Ti Surge 2011, the uh, videos are on there, and there's the. There is yeah. Look for the talk that I did last year, and it should link to the YouTube video. It's about 50 minutes long. It talks about its design and the motivation for it. Any other questions? Gave everybody a lot longer than 100 milliseconds. All right, enjoy lunch. <laughs>